During the process of going through the Zins Award uh, selections, uh, it's always a bittersweet uh, kind of feeling that um, gets generated among many of us at Castle. Uh, Joe was a dear friend and a very valued colleague. Uh, he was a professor in the College of Education at the University of Cincinnati. He was an internationally renowned um, leader uh, in uh, the areas of social competence promotion, prevention, and individual and organizational consultation. Uh, he was a member of Castle's first leadership team starting in 1994. Uh, Joe published more than 150 scientific uh, publications. Uh, he was a co-author of Promoting Social and Emotional Learnings, Guidelines for Educators, who are, which was the book uh, in 1997 where we really defined and introduced the field of social and emotional learning. Uh, Joe is also the lead editor of Building Academic Success on Social and Emotional Learning, What's the Research Say? Uh, and that was a truly groundbreaking effort. Some people think about the meta-analysis in 2011 that linked SEL um, to academic performance outcomes, but Joe uh, took the lead really in, in a book in 2004 that laid the foundation for uh, much of the work we have done linking SEL to a broad array of outcomes, including uh, academic success. Um, and then, um, shockingly, in 2016, uh, 2006, uh, Joe uh, died of a heart attack at the age of 56. And the, the question for all of us, what, what, what do you do when a dear, a uh, friend and colleague uh, leaves us much too early. Um, and we don't want to forget him. We'll never forget uh, Joe um, uh, and all that he meant to us and all that he meant to the field of social and emotional learning. Um, so one thing we did was we established the uh, Joseph E. Zins Award for SEL Action Research. The Zins Award honors people uh, that go beyond conducting research for the sake of research. Uh, we honor those who conduct action research to provide evidence-based guidance for policymakers and practitioners. Uh, and, and so we feel sadness still uh, 14 years later uh, from losing Joe in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, but there's a sweet aspect um, to some of the things that have followed. Uh, over the years, uh, Castle has honored the most amazing and productive and creative uh, groundbreaking researchers in the field of social and emotional learning. Uh, we invite invitations, nominations, uh, uh, for people to be considered. And we have the pleasure of reviewing their records and um, reading their articles. Um, and then, of course, we have the challenge of narrowing things down and picking uh, two awardees. And this year, we have two uh, fantastic, fantastically accomplished awardees. Um, um, and uh, one is Clark McCowan, and the other is uh, Laura Hamilton. Uh, and I'm going to briefly uh, say a few words both about Clark and Laura and then turn things over uh, to Clark um, uh, as our first presenter. Uh, Clark McCowan is an associate professor of behavioral sciences at Rush University Medical Center and the founder and president of uh, XEL Labs. Uh, Clark is an international leader in the field of SEL assessment. Um, uh, and my assessment is that he knows more about SEL assessment probably than anyone. Um, and he does a lot of interesting, cool things. Uh, among other things, he creates technically sol sound web-based interactive tasks that assess competencies directly by requiring students to demonstrate what they know and understand. So this is different than a self-report measure. It's different than 
um, uh, ratings by others. This is actually a demonstration of the skills and competencies um, uh, that kids know in the area of social and emotional learning. But it, he goes beyond that because he takes these uh, high quality competence assessments that support teaching and learning, uh, to support teaching and learning. And that's uh, uh, an important and an extraordinary link in the field uh, uh, that lays a foundation for continuous improvement of uh, quality instruction for children. Uh, some of Clark's uh, recent and influential publications include Children's Social and Emotional Competence Assessment, The Current State of the Field, and A Vision for Its Future. Um, that document is the major statement right now, I think, for the field about what we've accomplished and where we need to go. Uh, he wrote uh, with Beth Herman from um, uh, Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, a, a brief called SEL Assessment to Support Effective Social and Emotional Learning Practices at Scale. Uh, this is thinking about how to expand the work. Uh, uh, what impact can this have on, on, on states who support uh, the implementation of social and emotional learning of high quality? And then most recently, he's published a book uh, assessing student social and emotional learning, a guide to meaningful measurement. And again, um, meaningful measurement, not just assessment for assessment's sake, but uh, how do practitioners uh, use quality assessment to advance their efforts? And today, Clark is going to talk about assessment and the future of uh, SEL. Uh, Laura Hamilton is general manager of research centers at ETS. Uh, she oversees uh, research centers that focus on a number of cross-cutting domains to help inform decision-making and advance the science and practice of assessment uh, and learning. Uh, previously, Laura was the director of RAND's Center for SEL Research and a distinguished chair in learning and assessment. Uh, Laura's research uh, has focused on producing evidence-based guidance to inform K-12 education policy and practice, uh, particularly in the areas of social and emotional and civic learning. Uh, Laura and her colleagues have developed an, an influential portfolio of research on SEL assessment that resulted in the RAND Education Assessment Finder. Uh, they conducted um, an important um, systemic uh, review in 2017 that categorized SEL programs according to evidence tiers specified in the Every Student uh, Succeeds Act. And then they went beyond that to create a public a companion guide that has been cited in recent federal legislation that authorized uh, spending for SEL. Uh, she co-leads a research evaluation of the Wallace Foundation's Partnership for Social and Emotional Learning Initiative, um, which is examining comprehensive SEL in school and in after school uh, settings. Um, uh, there are major studies and projects that have been done um, in social and emotional learning. This, this effort to connect during school and out of school time and look at the implementation and out uh, of these efforts and the coordination of the efforts and the outcomes they produce is probably the most important ongoing study right now, uh, I believe, in the field. Um, she's also been involved actively with RAND's American Education Panel, uh, where they take nationally representative data on SEL supports, beliefs, and practices among teachers, principals, and uh, district leaders across the US so she can monitor the growth and the development and the interest and where the focus of the field needs to go. And finally, um, she's focused a great deal on the development of students' civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions. And that's going to be the focus of her presentation today, uh, supporting students' civic learning through SEL. Uh, I, I can say uh, that Joe, uh, Sins would have been uh, thrilled that we're recognizing these two extraordinary action researchers. And now I'm going to turn things over first to Clark, and then he'll turn things over to uh, Laura. Uh, and we look forward, Clark uh, and Laura, to hearing your remarks today. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Roger, for that kind introduction. And uh, I just want to say, first of all, uh, that I, I'm grateful to be to be recognized with the Joseph Zins Award, and I want to thank Castle and to thank everybody who uh, really made the work that I'm going to describe today possible. All the colleagues and mentors and uh, and friends and educators uh, who really have uh, together shaped my way of thinking uh, about assessment and its role in the field of SEL. So what I want to do is share with you some of my current thinking about SEL assessment and its role in the field, and also to share with you some of the ways that my thinking has evolved over the past few years. Uh, before I start, though, I want to make clear that when I talk about social and emotional competencies, I'm talking about the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that we affirmatively want students to develop to be successful participants in school and life. These are the competencies described by the CASEL model, you know, self-awareness, self self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. These are good things that we're trying to nurture in students. The reason I mention this is because um, these days, when people talk about social and emotional wellness, uh, I think they're talking about that, the competencies we want to be nurturing, and they're talking about mental health or the burden of symptoms that children are bringing to school with them from difficult uh, life circumstances, things like anxiety and depression. Those are things that get in the way and we wanna remove those barriers. And that's a, that's a legitimate concern itself. But today, the focus of assessment uh, and SEL in general, I think should remain on nurturing the competencies we want kids to develop to succeed. Um, I also wanna acknowledge the context. Um, there's a pandemic raging out there, and there have been all kinds of challenges that have come with that uh, for, for educators in particular who are really on the, on the front lines. And I want to note two things. One, uh, that I, I, from my perspective, never has the ingenuity and commitment of educators been more on display, and, uh, and never has the stresses of being an educator been clearer. So for those of you who are educators uh, on this, uh, this webinar, I want to thank you for the, all that you do uh, to support student social and emotional and academic competence in the face of these challenges. Now I'm going to talk about SEL assessment in general, and my hope is that, uh, that what I describe is relevant uh, to in the context of a pandemic, but it'll also be relevant when uh, the, the pandemic has, uh, is in the rearview mirror. All right, until recently, I think the world of SEL has been largely focused on developing, validating, and scaling programs, curricula, and practices that are designed to nurture the competencies that I just described. And that, um, uh, uh, that that's the right thing. We all want to actually act to make things better. And um, serious consideration, though, of assessment and its role in practice has, uh, is, is a relatively recent development to comparison. I think this is because we really do want to actually make good things happen. And uh, where does that happen? That happens in intervention. That happens in teaching. That happens in curricula and instruction. It doesn't necessarily happen in assessment. And in that context, actually, assessment can seem a little bit like an afterthought or even kind of inert. So my best uh, guess is that that's part of the reason why assessment has lagged intervention development in the field of SEL. But as you can probably guess, I see it differently. I don't think assessment is inert, and I don't think it should be an afterthought. The way I see it, no less than the future of the field rests on our continued commitment to evidence, uh, and that that commitment to evidence integrated with practice is really about SEL assessment. How do we take good assessment that's feasibly used in the context of, uh, of schools and classrooms uh, to make sure that what we're doing works, to make sure that we're focusing on the right activities and adult actions, and to continuously improve uh, the, the, the practice of SEL even as the field evolves. Now, I don't want to bury the lead, so I'm going to give you my perspective in brief. Uh, so this is the headline. One, uh, SEL, as we know, has a strong evidence base, most clearly uh, summarized in meta-analyses of field trials showing that when SEL programs and, and practices are implemented well, they yield benefit to, to, in terms of student outcomes. Two, in part because of uh, this evidence, uh, SEL programs are now widely used. A growing number of states are adopting SEL standards and uh, SEL is becoming a more central feature of the instructional and educational landscape. 
Uh, three, assessment is generally uh, not well integrated with SEL practice, although I think that's evolving and changing. As a result of that, we don't always know what's happening and whether it's working. At the same time, we know that implementing evidence-based SEL programs is a challenge. It's hard to do it well, and practice uh, varies tremendously in terms of the uh, intensity and quality of implementation, but we're not sure where it's happening well and where it's not happening as well. At the same time also, all kinds of practices are being rolled out and marketed as SEL. Some of those practices and programs are likely to be effective, some are likely not to be effective. But in the absence of, of evidence to maintain quality and impact at scale, SEL's impact could be diluted. Diluted, not diluted, diluted. And um, in addition to that, in the absence of strong evidence that SEL remains an effective and vibrant form of, uh, of intervention to support students, opinions could have an outsized influence. Do you know a few loud voices who uh, say that SEL is not a good thing or isn't working could really be persuasive in, the, in a vacuum of, of data. And so in my view, to ensure the vitality of the field, to ensure its continued impact, to make sure that what's happening in classrooms and schools are effective and targeted, uh, requires that uh, assessment is integrated with practice in, in a very uh, concrete way. And Roger mentioned the brief that Beth Herman and I wrote uh, about uh, SEL assessments, policy and practice. Um, and I think we'll probably put that in the chat window so you can click to it if you're interested in reading more about that perspective. Okay, so if assessment is important, if you buy this premise that we really need to double down on our commitment to evidence, one of the questions is what is important for us to assess? Now my um, initial thinking about this uh, is, I'm going to talk about that, but the, my thinking has evolved. Um, and the evolution in my thinking about assessment has come from developing assessments and uh, having them be out in the field and interacting with people using them and making sense of the data and making decisions based on practice and, uh, and talking with colleagues in universities and uh, elementary schools and elsewhere. So really, um, this is about, I, I've really taken an action research approach to this, which is let's make our best guess about the best way to assess, put it out in the world, learn from that, and continue to improve. So I'm trying to walk the talk of continuous improvement in assessment. How did I first get involved in this? Well, my first involvement in SEL assessment was really actually as a clinician scientist at Rush University Medical Center, which Roger mentioned. Um, I am a child clinical psychologist by training, and I uh, used to do a lot of clinical assessment as part of my practice. My colleagues and I were continually uh, frustrated because a lot of the kids who had come to our clinic uh, had social challenges, and we felt like we just didn't have a lot of uh, ways to understand what was getting in the way for them. If a child couldn't read, we had wonderful instruments to understand what was interfering and to help chart a course for improvement. But if a child couldn't make friends or was rejected by their peers, we felt that there really weren't the equivalent kinds of um, assessments. Yes, there were good teacher and parent rating scales, but beyond that, there was kind of not a lot. So we started to integrate uh, experimental measures of things like emotion recognition, empathy, social problem solving, and so on into our assessment practice. And, uh, and we looked at the clinical chart data to see, hey, is this actually yielding data that's, that's valuable above and beyond other things that we're, uh, we're using? And we found some initial evidence that it really was helpful. So we expanded our work and took some of these experimental measures out into schools to uh, evaluate their uh, technical properties with general education students, typically developing students. And as we did that, uh, we talked with our friends in those schools, our uh, education colleagues, leaders, and teachers. And they said, you know, you shouldn't be doing this just for kids with problems. This is th these competencies that you're trying to measure are competencies that all kids need to develop. And by the way, this is happening in Illinois not too long after the Illinois SEL standards were adopted. And they said, you're measuring the things that are in the standards and the things that are in the SEL programs that we're using, programs like Second Step. And um, so please pivot. Don't just focus on clinical populations. Assess for everyone. That's a summary of the conversation. 
And so we, uh, we did, and we, we sought and received funding from the Institute of Education Sciences, first to develop an early elementary assessment, then to develop a late elementary assessment, and most recently to develop a middle school assessment. As Roger mentioned, these are web-based assessments. Uh, they involve interactive tasks uh, that assess competencies directly. Kids have to demonstrate uh, their, their competencies and show what they know. For example, to get at how well kids understand others' emotions, they look at pictures and say what the person is feeling from their facial expression. They're not rating their competence, and no, a third party is not rating their competence. They're showing uh, what they know. And so we, we developed these assessments. We put them through rigorous field trials. They work quite well. Our, our education colleagues like them a lot. And uh, we've continuously evolved them in response to feedback about uh, both reporting and uh, the technical properties of the assessments. We also think the direct assessment approach overcomes some of the limitations that come from self-report and, and teacher rating scales. Um, so as Roger mentioned, the state of the field report uh, that was really a collaborative effort of the entire uh, Castle SEL assessment work group, I just had the honor of being uh, the lead author of pulling together others' ideas. Uh, I think that's an excellent resource for those who are interested in reading more, and I hope we can put that in the chat window. And um, the book that uh, Roger mentioned that I wrote with uh, Norton uh, is, is uh, an attempt to be a really useful guide for educators who want to integrate uh, competence assessment into their uh, SEL practice. Okay, so um, so we built a better mousetrap, right? Uh, end of story, right? Well, actually, no. Uh, first of all, most traps always need improving, so we're continuing to work on building, validating, improving <clears throat> social emotional competence assessments. But I think more importantly, uh, in conversations with uh, colleagues, particularly in academia, um, my thinking has evolved. Uh, now, it, it, there's a small, I think, but vocal subset of colleagues of mine who feel that, um, well, they sound a cautionary note about competence assessment. Um, they worry that focusing too much on students could lead to labeling, stigma, uh, inequitable uh, disciplinary practice. And the strong form of this argument, which I've heard people say many times, is that we should not as uh, assess competence, but we should focus and exclusively on assessing adult practice and uh, climate. Now, I do agree that all assessment carries some risk, but I don't agree with the strong view that we shouldn't assess competence. Because forbidding competence assessment is like, you know, working with one hand tied behind your back. If you think the work of SEL is to teach discrete competencies, kind of like, you know, it's, it's not a perfect analogy, but kind of like teaching math is about teaching discrete competencies. We should use assessment uh, just as we would use math assessment data uh, to, guide, uh, to guide instruction and to measure student progress in a low stakes way. And we should offer guidance to educators about the use of assessment data that, that maximizes the benefit of that data and mitigates the risk. I think that's possible. Now, although I don't view, uh, agree with the uh, idea that you shouldn't do competence assessment, I do agree with my colleagues that it's not the only thing that we need to assess, okay? Uh, I think that uh, it's, it's important to assess both uh, competence, implementation, and climate. We need to know what adults are doing because it's when adults are doing SEL practices, programs, uh, and instruction that we can be uh, confident that competencies will improve. And adult practices influence the uh, overall climate that, uh, that are uh, likely to produce the benefits that we want. So I think integrating the assessment of implementation climate and competence in a unified system is, in my view, the best way to support practice and the larger field of SEL. And to test this model, my colleagues and I have developed an integrated uh, assessment of climate competence and uh, program adherence that uh, our uh, education colleagues are using right now. So one of the questions is, how might this concept of integrated assessment of implementation, competence, and climate feasibly and usefully be integrated into practice? Well, let's look at a, a kind of a pra basic practice model. Uh, so imagine you're in a school and in the fall, you benchmark climate and competence. So assess early in the school year. And then you take those data and have um, uh, organized systematic data review discussions about climate and competence. And based 
on the what you learn about student competence and climate. You make a plan for adult actions to uh, to optimize the climate and to teach the competencies that students need to know the most. As you execute that plan, periodically measure what adults are doing. In other words, measure implementation. And uh, where you can use those data, the implementation data, to decide where to guide coaching resources where they're needed the most to support high quality and consistent uh, implementation and adult practices. Then after a period of executing that plan, reassess competence and climate and go ahead and review the data to see what kind of progress you've made, see where things have moved in the direction you wanted, where they haven't, and evaluate what the next steps are. And then go ahead and repeat that process. You see, this is it's not a loop. It's kind of not depicted as a circle, but it really is about a, a, a way to use data in the fall to benchmark and plan to make sure that you're doing what you said you were going to do uh, from the fall data and then evaluating what kind of progress students have made in the end. You need all three of these kinds of data to do this, I think, in the best way possible, though any one of them uh, can be supportive of practice in a positive way. Uh, okay, so back to why assessment matters. Um, I think if assessment is integrated into uh, SEL practice in this way, we can you know, use implementation data to guide coaching resources, support consistent high quality implementation, use climate data to help adults create warm, welcoming and positive environments, use competence assessment data to differentiate instruction and measure progress in implementation, climate and competence over time and use those data to make, uh, make adjustments to practice so that we're, we're evolving local practice at the classroom and school level based on the local uh, needs and what the data are telling us. This way, as SEL goes big and is implemented widely, uh, we can stay rooted in what's happening and what impact it's, it's having. I think that's gonna be really key for the field. It's gonna be uh, really important for us to maintain that continued commit, commitment to evidence to have a vital field that uh, is able to withstand strong opinions about it uh, so that we can respond to those opinions with data about what's working and, and why. Okay, okay, so where do we go from here? What's, what are the next steps? There's always more to do, right? Uh, as an assessment developer, I'm certain that we can continue to create better assessments. So we're gonna keep working on building a better mousetrap and we need to continue investing in assessment development to that end. Next, educators, uh, educators really vary in their readiness to use uh, SEL assessment data, sometimes even academic data, uh, to its greatest benefit. So I think there's a real need for professional learning, including pre-service training and in-service professional development to support the uh, high quality use of uh, SEL assessment data to inform decision making in the most constructive way possible. Third, you know, there's a growing focus for all kinds of uh, reasons uh, it, uh, on, on equity, uh, and this is as it should be. So it raises the question, how can assessment help advance the cause of equity? Well, one way is to ensure that our conception of SEL and the way it's measured uh, incorporates concepts around equity. And uh, CASEL's recently revised definitions of, uh, of the CASEL competencies build on what was there and add uh, some uh, equity perspective comp focused competencies. And I think that's a really good thing. That seems to be the main focus uh, in the assessment world. Assess assessors are trying to figure out how to measure some of these newer competencies. I'm, I think there's another focus that is as important or more important, but hardly ever discussed, which is assessment should position itself to provide evidence of what's, what works and what does not work in creating a more just and equitable world, right? That's less about the content of the assessment, and it's more about how it's used to measure whether the equity practices that are being implemented are actually having the impact we intend. Assessment, in other words, should really be uh, in service to evidence-based equity in addition to evidence-based SEL. And fourth, uh, click please. Uh, states can play a really important role in supporting the constructive use of SEL assessment. Again, the, the uh, brief that Beth and I wrote, uh, I think provides a, a good summary of this, but 
states can uh, support SEL assessment used by adopting standards to clarify the competencies kids should know and be able to demonstrate. Those are things that should be assessed. Uh, states can encourage the constructive use of assessment. They can provide guidance in the selection and use of assessments. They can place kind of guardrails around assessment, saying uh, what the decisions are that should and shouldn't be made based on assessment data and ensure that assessment data are more focused on practice improvement than accountability, for example. And they can incentivize professional learning focused on assessment and data use to make sure that uh, educators are ready to uh, get the most out of their assessment data to inform teaching, learning, and student outcomes. I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff that's not on this list uh, that, that should be addressed. But I think these are some of the key things that I see as being important moving forward. And I'm really energized and excited about, about moving forward to try to solve some of these uh, issues and discover new ones. So, uh, you know, in the end, I just want to say again how grateful I am to be recognized by the, the Zins Award. Thank you so much to Castle and to all those who supported this work. Um, I'm really looking forward to continuing it. And now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce you to my colleague and friend, Laura Hamilton, uh, who's going to speak about uh, civics education. Thanks so much, Clark. Um, I, I always learn so much every time I hear you talk, so I, I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, I, too, want to thank Castle for this wonderful award. Um, I've benefited so much from my interactions with CASEL um, and especially my participation on the assessment work group, which Clark mentioned. Um, that's actually where I first met Clark. Um, so that makes this award especially uh, meaningful. Um, also, Roger mentioned the Wallace-funded study of SEL in schools and OST programs. And I wanted to mention that Clark has played a key role in that project as we've been working with him to use it as one of our, to use uh, CellWeb as one of our outcome measures. Um, I also want to acknowledge my RAND colleagues who co-authored the reports that I'll be talking about today. Their names are here, Chris Doss, Julia Kaufman, and Lynn Hu. Um, really indebted to a terrific group of individuals and organizations working to ensure equitable access to high quality supports for students' social, emotional, and academic learning. I happen to be giving this presentation in the midst of a professional transition from RAND to ETS. Um, and I've really been um, impressed to, at all of the colleagues at both organizations who are very committed to this goal. To move the field forward, it's going to take a massive coordinated effort among research organizations, technical assistance providers, policymakers, and most importantly, the educators who are doing the challenging, important work in youth serving organizations all over the country and across the world. And it'll be crucial that we continue to collaborate and learn from one another. So I'm especially thankful to have this opportunity to share some of our work and hear from all of you about ways that we can work together. So here's what I'll cover in this presentation. I'll start with some background about civic learning and its connection to SEL. I'll then briefly describe how we gathered information from teachers across the US about how they think about and promote both SEL and civics. I'll share just a few key findings and then conclude with some ideas about next steps for the field. Um, so I'll start with uh, some background on civic learning and SEL. So next, please. Um, so I wanted to first explain why I'm focusing on civics in a talk that's supposed to be about SEL. While much of my work has examined SEL broadly, in recent years I've become interested in civic education and the ways that SEL can support it. Public schools in the US were founded on a civic mission. But that's been difficult to maintain in recent decades, as schools have faced pressure to focus on a small number of academic subjects and to prepare students for economic success, which is often defined in fairly narrow terms. So in the last several years, there's been a small but growing chorus of voices advocating for a shift back to a stronger civic ed focus. There are several likely reasons for this. So first, the Every Student Succeeds Act has provided an opportunity for states to expand their systems to incorporate new measures and we've seen growing interest at the state and local levels in assessing school climate and other constructs that relate to civic engagement. Second, several recent studies have demonstrated that schools can influence long-term outcomes related to civic engagement, including likelihood of voting or volunteering. Third, the growing urgency for schools to address issues around racial justice and equity has led educators to examine how they can revise their curricula and practices to be culturally relevant and anti-racist, and to equip students with the skills and dispositions that will propel them to work forward toward a more equitable and fair society. 
And then finally, it's not news to anyone in this group that SEL is widespread and popular among educators. And if anything, the call for SEL has grown more urgent in response to the current reliance on remote learning and all of the challenges that Clark so eloquently described. I'll spend the early part of this presentation discussing how SEL is relevant to efforts to increase schools' emphasis on civics. So civics often makes us think of what we learned in high school government class, but civic learning encompasses a much broader set of knowledge, skills, and dispositions. The set of competencies you see here has been identified by scholars and practitioners, including some seminal work that the Carnegie Corporation of New York supported in the early 2000s. This definition was developed primarily to refer to civic ed in the US, but it's clearly relevant beyond our borders. And you can probably see the connection to SEL here. Um, so let's look at what SEL involves. There are lots of different frameworks, but this is a CASEL sponsored briefing. And more importantly, I find the CASEL framework useful and comprehensive. This is the recently updated version, which includes the five broad areas of competence that you see listed here. If you go to the website where this lives, you can find detailed descriptions of each area along with some specific competencies. So I'll show you just a few examples of the specific competencies listed on CASEL's website, highlighting ones that are especially aligned with current definitions of civic learning. Under self-awareness, for example, you see competencies like developing a sense of purpose and identifying cultural assets, which are crucial to effective civic engagement. Let's look at self-management. Note that managing one's emotions can be especially critical for how people respond to information in the media or from peers, and this is central to civic learning. Next. Responsible decision-making, similarly, is crucial for engagement in a democracy and involves making reasoned judgments and evaluating the likely impact of one's actions on others. So under relationship skills, we see demonstrating cultural competency and engaging in collaborative problem solving, both of which have obvious connections to civic engagement. And then finally, here's social awareness. And again, you can see the connection to civics. It's also important to point out that the boundaries among these five categories aren't always clear cut, and that bringing them together in teaching, learning, and assessment can create some valuable synergies. You can also see how these skills interact with critical thinking and other more traditional academic skills. And it's one reason you won't hear me use the term non-cognitive to describe these skills, despite the popularity of that term. So let's shift over to discussing how schools can promote these outcomes. Scholars have identified various ways that schools and others can engage students in civic learning, and they've categorized these into what have come to be known as the 10 promising practices. Um, the reports that, um, that will be shared with you provide more detail on where these come from and, and what they mean. So I won't spend a lot of time on them. Um, but you can see that SEL is listed here as a specific promising practice, but there are other practices that incorporate elements of SEL. Student participation in school governance, for example, draws on youth voice. School climate reform is also widely viewed as an important strategy for promoting SEL. So finally, let's consider where civic learning and SEL happen. The Outer Rings and Castle's framework help convey the idea that SEL happens in a variety of places and through many different mechanisms. The same is true for civic learning. And so I'll show just a few examples of ways that the promising practices can be enacted across these settings. So you can click. Discussions of current events can happen in the classroom. Simulations of the democratic process can occur at the school level. So mock elections, for instance, are fairly common and they offer great learning opportunities if they're done well. News media literacy offers a way to bring families into learning through some of the resources that are available through organizations like Common Sense Media. And then finally, service learning, which is more than just volunteering, can promote engagement with the community. So now that we've talked about the connection between SEL and civics, I'll say a bit about why and how we gather data from teachers about how they're approaching these areas. So it's clear that many different practitioner groups could provide valuable information about this topic. For the work I'll discuss today, I'm focusing on teachers for a few reasons. First, although the practices I described earlier can occur both in and out of the classroom, teachers are arguably in the best position to speak about the wide range of practices in their schools, and they spend the most time working directly with students. Teachers also have a significant responsibility to develop lessons and create or implement instructional materials. Beyond just instruction, teachers create conditions in the classroom, such as a positive climate and a sense of belonging that support civic development. And research has demonstrated that teachers' effects on student learning can last well into adulthood. 
Understanding teachers' experiences and identifying their needs is crucial for informed education policymaking. So to gather nationally representative data, we used RAND's American Educator Panels that Roger described to you. I won't spend time discussing the methodological details here, but they're available in the reports that we'll share. The main feature that's important to mention is that the panels allow us to select high quality samples and the results are weighted to produce nationally representative estimates for the full samples and for subgroups such as high school teachers or those working in high need schools. I'm presenting results from two separate surveys today. One is a survey of K-12 teachers in all subjects about SEL and the other is a survey of social studies teachers in K-12 and it examines civic learning. That latter survey was conducted as part of RAND's Truth Decay Initiative, which is examining the diminishing role of facts and analysis in public life. I'm grateful to both the Wallace Foundation and the generous donors who contributed to RAND's Truth Decay Initiative for the funding for this work. Our samples are drawn from the US, but many of the lessons apply to other nations. Um, and especially given the growing enthusiasm for both SEL and civic learning that I've heard from interactions I and others have had with educators in other nations. So we hope this will be relevant um, to those of you who are joining from outside the US. Okay, so my goal for today, given the limited time, is to highlight just a few findings that cut across the SEL and civic education data and that have implications for the, where the field goes from here. First, we looked at the frequency with which teachers used various SEL and civic ed practices. Consistent with other work, we found widespread reported use of SEL practices, including explicit instruction. The grade level differences I show here aren't surprising given what we know about how SEL for elementary and older students is often conceptualized. Okay, click. So on the civic ed survey, we saw widespread emphasis on SEL and climate, and again, some differences by grade level. These grade level differences actually provide some opportunities. Secondary teachers could use more guidance about how to explicitly address SEL through academics and extracurriculars. Elementary teachers have opportunities to engage their students in age-appropriate SEL and civic education activities that, that are currently more common at the secondary level, such as contributing to dis decisions at the school level or participating in simulations of the democratic process. But here's one set of results from the SEL, SEL survey that I wanted to highlight. The labels might be a little hard to read, but the results indicate that the vast majority of teachers agree that they can't teach their students effectively unless they consider their social and emotional needs and that efforts to promote SEL will improve academic achievement. This is encouraging news, as it suggests that teachers don't necessarily view SEL and academics as competing priorities. At the same time, most teachers said pressure to improve student academic achievement makes it hard to focus on SEL. We found similar results from the Civic Ed Survey, with many teachers indicating that pressure to cover other subjects was an obstacle to promoting civic learning. So while teachers are aware of the value of a whole child approach, they may need additional guidance on how to prioritize social, emotional, and civic learning while also meeting academic requirements. One type of resource that could better help this um, with this integration is better instructional materials and guidance on how to use them. So here are a few findings from both surveys that relate to that topic. Many teachers wanted more professional development to integrate SEL and civics into academic instruction. They also expressed a need for materials and strategies to better engage students. And of course, this is a pl place where SEL can be helpful. Many teachers had to modify materials to make them culturally relevant and media literacy in use was a particular need. So together, these findings suggest that helping teachers incorporate good SEL instructional strategies into their instruction could promote civic learning. So here's some findings from the Civic Ed Survey, and I wanted to highlight this because of the major role that media plays in the lives of students and adults, especially when it comes to civic-related activities such as voting. There's a lot of detail here, which you can review later in the published report if you like. But the main thing to note is teachers reported numerous media-related concerns, including students developing unhealthy relationships online, sharing too much personal information, treating each other, treating others unkindly, and limited ability to evaluate the credibility of online information. So again, lots of connection with SEL. Another area where we saw a need for additional supports is exactly what uh, Clark was just talking about. Um, he's done so much in this area and I've appreciated the opportunities to learn from him about it. Our results suggest a need for more of the type of support that Clark described. So we found that data use when was an expressed area of need for additional professional development. 
Our surveys and other work has pointed out that lack of assessment options to guide instruction are a hindrance. And so we found that student surveys, um, behavioral observations, and multiple choice tests were common instructional uh, or assessment methods. Um, and many elementary and secondary teachers reported needing assessments that would help them better understand su students' civic knowledge and skills. Um, there are lots of assessment uh, innovations being developed right now, some at my own organization, ETS, and some by Clark's organization, as well as many others. Um, but this is an area that's ripe for R&D uh, investment. And then the final point on this slide is about standards. Um, so most teachers in states that had SEL standards were unaware of them. Similarly, while all states have some form of social studies standards that address aspects of civic learning, many teachers didn't know about them. Standards can provide helpful guidance about the competencies teachers should promote, but only if teachers are aware of them and have resources to connect them to their instruction. Okay, now the next one. So for the last set of findings, I wanna highlight some relationships we found based on regression analyses that controlled for other factors. We can't determine these relationships are causal, but combined with other work in the field, they strongly suggest a set of conditions that should be in place to enable teachers to promote students' social, emotional, and civic learning. So on the first bullet, we found that a belief that there are standards in SEL or civics is what matters for predicting instructional practice. Whether the state actually had standards didn't predict practices. This reinforces my previous point about the need for awareness of standards. On the second point, we measured teachers' well-being with the Affective Experiences Scale, an instrument developed by the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. We found that teachers' emotional well-being related to their work, such as having a sense of purpose, predicted their emphasis on SEL for students. Other factors that predicted practices were quality instructional materials, professional learning, and a supportive school culture. It's important to point out that we found disparities across schools in many of these conditions, with teachers in schools serving majorities of students of color or low-income students reporting less access to many supports. Um, so I want to briefly note that there are lots of great resources out there to support SEL and civic learning. I'm showing you just a few. Um, so for one example, History Maker VR is a virtual reality tool that allows students to engage in simulations of historical figures and can be used as a teaching and assessment tool. The Castle resource I list here is specifically about ways to use SEL in the wake of the contentious election we just experienced. And there are lots more. So um, I think it's it's our duty as, as researchers and, and practitioners and policymakers to make these, these um, kinds of resources more available to educators. So let me wrap up with just a few of the key implications that we've drawn from this work. There's lots we can do as practitioners, researchers, and policymakers to promote the development of the full array of competencies youth will need to succeed and thrive. So first, we need to expand the conversation about SEL to incorporate civic learning and help educators and others understand how crucial it is that youth develop these competencies. I mentioned collaboration at the beginning. We need to work together across organizations, across disciplines, and across countries. Diverse perspectives and experiences will be needed to move the field forward in a way that benefits all youth and, and practitioner voices are particularly important here. Third, we need to support the adults in the system as well as the kids. This could involve both high quality PD as well as attending to the social and emotional well-being of educators, which is crucial for ensuring high quality supports for children. Fourth, we need more and better direct assessments of SEL and civic outcomes, including performance-based assessments. There's also a need for training to use data in ways that will benefit and not harm students. Fifth, helping educators to integrate SEL and civics into other subjects will enable them to promote, to promote whole child competencies while also attending to academic needs and pressures. We know that many teachers are already doing this in their instruction, but they may not be doing it in a, in a deliberate way. There are great opportunities through extracurricular activities like sports or music, and many ways to incorporate these competencies into academic activities like character analysis in English or information literacy in science. Um, so this is really a, a, an important area that we need to address moving forward. Then finally, and most importantly, we need to provide more equitable SEL, civics, and academic learning opportunities to all students while maintaining high standards for college, career, and civic readiness. As I noted at the beginning of this talk, the original goals of the American system of public education included both citizenship and academics. These goals are as important now as they ever were, both in the US and around the world. 
I look forward to working with many of you to ensure that research policy and practice are aligned around these goals. And that's all I have. Thanks again. Um, I really um, am grateful for this opportunity and grateful to everybody for all of the, the wonderful work that you're doing um, and look forward to, to more collaboration. Thank you, Laura. That was great. And I do wish we had more time to dive into um, all of the facts and findings um, from those research studies. But as Laura mentioned, we will be sharing um, links to both her research and to um, many of the documents and research that Clark spoke about as well. So keep an eye on your inbox tomorrow um, for links to all of those resources. And then um, you can dive deeper on your own. Um, so let's go ahead and take some questions. We've got a few minutes and we do have some questions coming in. Um, and this question is actually directed to both of you, um, but Clark, maybe why don't you um, kick us off and give Laura a chance to catch her breath after her presentation. Um, so how do you see SEL research potentially guiding educational reform as we continue in this digital and hybrid learning time? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there are a couple of uh, pieces to that. One is, um, what is the impact of uh, being hybrid, uh, being at home learning on students' social and emotional development? And research is in a good position to uh, look at those kinds of impacts. Um, a, a second is in the other direction. Um, how do we best deliver I think nobody's figured this out, but I know there's a lot of local innovation going on, but how do we best deliver uh, distance learning experiences that engage students and support their academic, social, and emotional learning? Um, you know, the world has had to pivot very quickly, including the educational world, and I see a lot of really cool creative practices. I'd love uh, to do some uh, systematic research to see which of those is really uh, nurturing the competencies that we that we want to. So I think uh, the research world is in a good position to help with those. I think there are other issues too. Uh, you know, we're uh, interested in how, how well do assessments work when they're uh, administered at home uh, versus at school. And it seems the early data that we're seeing is that um, it, with the right conditions, uh, SEL assessment can be effective at home as it is in school. Um, so I think I think the research world has a lot uh, of potential contribution. The problem is research moves so slowly, and the pandemic has moved so quickly. So you know, I think a question that I know Mark Schneider at IES is concerned about is how do we do rapid cycle uh, kind of program impact evaluations that can really give us some uh, lessons and payoffs quickly, rather than waiting five years to do a giant randomized control trial. I don't think we've got that quite worked out yet, but I hope the research world does take that on. And I, I want to chime in with one comment, which is that um, talked, we talked about a, a lot about sort of youth voice and how that can promote civic engagement. Um, and this is an area where getting youth perspective is really important, just directly asking kids, how are things working for you? How are you doing? What could we be doing better? Kids have tons of creative ideas about how to use technology. So it offers an opportunity to really engage um, their perspectives in this decision making. Yeah, marrying that qualitative and quantitative research together um, mm -hmm. is, is very important always. Um, so Laura, um, a, another pandemic related question. Um, do you, from the research or from your own work, have, do you have some suggestions on promoting SEL and civic learning um, during this time? And I think not just the pandemic, but perhaps the election that we're still in the midst of? Yeah, so so I just I just mentioned one, and I think that um, the you know one of the things when we shifted to remote learning, teachers had so much on their minds and and so many challenges coming at them, and there was a lot of pressure to worry about um, you know test scores and academic achievement. Um, and so one of the you know bits of advice that I and many others have been giving is to really attend to those relationships. That that without those relationships and ensuring. Um, the kids are okay socially and emotionally, you won't get the academic learning. Um, and so finding ways to, to maintain relationships from a distance, I think, is one really, um, you know, important piece of this. Um, and then, you know, I think some of the, um, some of the resources I showed on, on the slide um, provide really good ways to, or ideas about how to talk about the election in ways that won't raise concerns about partisanship won't get parents yelling at you for for bringing up things that they don't want you to talk about in class which is always a concern um so programs like facing history and ourselves 
um, the castle resources around the election, and I'm not saying that just because this is castle. I really, I really um, do believe that those are useful. Um, so I would say, you know, check out some of those resources and and you know offer those to to educators as ways to engage in constructive debates with your kids because the, the kids are talking about this on their own um, anyway, and so this is a great way to bring some. Um, you know, make it a better learning opportunity by bringing that educator's perspective into those conversations.